Hello once again, and welcome to the Global on the Granite State podcast, your source for interesting international discussions, expert insights into complex global issues, and the easiest way to stay up to date on what is going on around the world. My name is Tim Horgan, and I am the Executive Director of the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire, and your host for this podcast. Before we get into today's interviews, I want to remind you all of our upcoming online global forum fundraisers. These great events help the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire to support our work and ensure we are able to continue to inform people about the importance of international connections and understanding. On November 10th, the Council will be hosting former Secretary of Defense William Perry and Plowshare Fund's Policy Director Tom Kalina to talk about nuclear weapons and presidential power. On December 2nd, we will be hosting former Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel for his insights into the future of global U.S. leadership. You will not want to miss these events. More information and registration can be found on our website at www.wacnh.org. Today, we are talking with Dr. Ezzedine Fischer, senior lecturer at Dartmouth College about the history of the Israeli-Arab conflict and what the normalization of relations really means today. Also, we speak with the new Director General of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in Boston, Jonathan Sun, about U.S.-Taiwan relations. Hope you enjoy! thing started with an American proposition. Recently, the whole idea of the Middle East peace process was turned on its head as three Arab countries, the UAE, Bahrain, and Sudan, have all begun the process to normalize relations between their government and Israel. The U.S. proposition that Dr. Ezzedine Fischer, senior lecturer at Dartmouth College, mentions here is the idea of land for peace in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I spoke with Dr. Fischer about these latest agreements and what they mean. However, let's jump back to get some additional background on how the conflict got to this point. The U.S. always had interests on both sides. It had interests with Israel because of the connection that a majority of Americans feel towards Israel, Christian, biblical connections, also European dissent and shared values. So for many reasons, there has been this strong connection between the United States and Israel. At the same time, there has been this convergence of interest. The United States rise as a superpower after the Second World War was connected intimately with its ability to guarantee the functioning of world economy and other global interests that are sensitive to what happens in the Middle East, not only because of oil, but because, you know, the Cold War, access and navigation, and so on. So if you want the best illustration of this dual commitment of the United States, you have to look at President Roosevelt, who made very strong promises to American Zionist organizations, and then went to the Middle East on his way back from meetings with the other victorious powers in in the war, and stopped in Egypt, uh, Suez Canal, and on the board of the American ship, he met with a little-known king of a country that's emerging called Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia was a newly consolidated state at that point, having been created in 1932 after a series of conquests by King Saud. Obviously, it would go on to become one of the U.S.'s most important strategic partners in the region. He spent hours with that little-known king. At the time, the U.S. didn't have relations with Saudi Arabia, diplomatic. So... At the end of this meeting, President Roosevelt made very strong pledges to Ibn Saud, among which that the United States is not going to do anything on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that might hurt or harm Arab states and the way they see the conflict. And then President Roosevelt came back to Washington with those two contradicting commitments, and then he died. Now, every administration since then had inherited this dual commitment. The best way for an American president to reconcile those conflicting interests is the peace process, is to bring Arabs and Israelis together. So 
it is the American Department of State that invented this land for peace concept. And that was immediately after the 1967 war. And the idea was that Israel would go back to its borders prior to, they were not official borders, they were lines of armistice, would go back to those lines of armistice prior to the war, in return for which the Arab states and the Arab world, including Palestinians, would recognize Israel's right to live in peace and security and recognize its borders. The U.S., not wanting to take sides in the conflict, passed this idea on to the British to have them introduce it at the U.N., and it was adopted as Security Council Resolution 242. And since then, 242 had become the cornerstone of the idea of peaceful settlement of the Arab-Israeli conflict, including the Palestinian-Israeli. Although 242 does not mention Palestinians by name, but it's understood from the context that ultimately the resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is included in that. The basic idea, the underpinning idea has been land, namely those territories that were occupied in 67 for peace. It would seem, therefore, that the resolution to this conflict should be fairly straightforward. However, since it has been going on for over 70 years now, there are obviously some tripping points that have held this back. What is the extent of the land? What are the borders? Of course, it's debatable. And if you give the text of the resolution to lawyers, they will obviously find different interpretations. But so is the case with the extent of the peace. What does peace mean? Is it just kind of cold, angry, resentful recognition? Or is it much more than that? Late Prime Minister Robin had kind of completed, if you want, the circle by developing this idea that the extent of the withdrawal will be commensurate with the extent of the peace. And if you put those two ideas together, I think you get the gist of the so-called two-state solution, a state for the Palestinians, a state for the Israelis. And the idea behind that is that the entire Arab world will join in recognition of Israel and in peace with Israel. This has been the conventional wisdom, the underpinning of the peace process. Not everybody agreed to every bit of it, obviously, those who are attached to the land liked the part about recognition more than the part about withdrawal. Those who are attached to the historical narratives like the part about withdrawal more than the part about peace. The original idea for the Jewish state was created initially by progressive left-leaning Jews, mainly of Eastern European descent. Because of their political ideals, they did not want to colonize the land, rather build a collaborative coexistence approach to nation building. But on the fringe, there was Jabotinsky and a more right wing, more nationalist than progressive, where the emphasis was on nationalism, Jewish homeland at any price, basically. And Jabotinsky will come up with the solution of how to deal with the Arabs who live in the Holy Land, ironically, is the one that would prevail. Jabotinsky was very lucid on this point. This stuff about reconciliation, living, and mutual benefit is nonsense. No Aboriginal population liked or accepted that a different nation comes to their land and occupy it and push them aside. They're going to resist this no matter what we do, and it makes sense that they do. In his words, those Zionists who think that they will welcome us because we are also progressive are in fact being condescendent and thinking that these people have no culture, these people have no identity and so on. They do and they will resist us. So what do we do? Conflict is inevitable. So we have to conduct ourselves in the conflict in a way that we become so victorious and we crush the resistance to a point that they lose hope of restoring the status quo ante. When they lose hope, then they can accept some sort of a partition of that. And then we can have peace. Without acknowledging this as like the official doctrine, but this became the story of the relationship between Israel and its neighbors. Due to this adversarial approach, relations between Israel and its Arab neighbors for the first 30 years or so did not go well at all. All attempts at peace were thwarted and... The conflict continues, basically from the civil war and then the war of independence, 47 and 48, establishment of the state. Then we have another war in 1956 that people forget about. It's called the Suez War, and 
people think usually of France and Britain occupying the Suez Canal and Eisenhower and the Soviet Union kicking them out and so on. And we forget that Israel actually occupied the entire Sinai Peninsula in 1956 in almost the same way that it will do in 1967. 1967 is probably the turning point. This is the Jabotinsky moment. This is the crushing victory or defeat, depends where you stand in the story. Until 1967, most of the Arab states were in denial of the fact that Israel does exist and that Israel has already become a state. Whether they see this as legitimate or illegitimate is a different matter. But many of those Arab states haven't even realized that Israel is here to stay. And so continued that rhetoric of liberation of Palestine from the river to the sea, restitution of Palestinian rights, you know, returning to status quo ante, basically. Which, again, you can make a case that this is legitimate demand, but practically and pragmatically and politically, that train had left the station a long time ago. They will come to understand this in the difficult way in 1967 and in their inability to do much about Israel's power. After the war in 1967, Security Council Resolution 242 comes into existence. Ironically enough, 242 will be accepted more by Israel than by Arab states. And the fact that Egypt accepted 242 was a big thing because it means Egypt accepted the right of Israel to live in peace and security. Egypt, when it did so, it emphasized the withdrawal part and downplayed the recognition part. Israel did the opposite. And in this ambivalence, we will spend the time between 67 and another war in 1973. Egyptians and Syrians believe they have won the war. Israel believes that it at least kind of a draw. But the war have explained in very clear terms to everybody that the military path has ran its course. The United States understood that it cannot leave this conflict unattended on the hope that it will kind of either go away or remain contained, that the local players are not going to be contained enough by the superpowers, and they will run amok and do something that disturbs their calculations. So after years of kind of neglecting the conflict and dismissing it, Kissinger and Nixon at the time kind of left everything in their hands and went and focused on that. And that pattern will repeat itself, by the way, as we go forward. In 1979, Egypt, under Sadat, formalizes a treaty with Israel, becoming the first Arab country to do so. It will take another war in Lebanon. It will take another decade of conflict in the Middle East until the first Gulf War. Then the United States is going to spearhead a massive peace process, bringing together in Madrid all Arab states and Israel. Your listeners might kind of wonder, what is the Gulf War and occupation of Kuwait got to do with Palestine and Israel? Saddam Hussein of Iraq became a pan-Arab hero, despite the fact that he occupied Kuwait, because he championed the Palestinian cause. And he was seen, and he played it up, obviously, in ways that other leaders today play it in Iran and in Turkey and so on. They played it up as the one who can stand for Israel and stand for Palestinian rights. In order for the United States to get Syria and Egypt and other Arab states to fight with the American soldiers against that pan-Arab nationalist hero of Iraq, they had to demonstrate to the Arab public opinion that there are no double standards, that from now on, the idea of foreign occupation is no longer acceptable. And therefore, as much as we will liberate Kuwait by war, we will liberate at least the West Bank and Gaza, what is now conventionally termed occupied Palestinian territories, and establish a Palestinian state there. And that gave legitimacy to a new kind of American initiative in the region. So the war in the Gulf enabled the Arab states to kind of come forward and be more outspoken about their readiness to reconcile with Israel and to actually sit in the same room with an Israeli government delegation, which wasn't done before. These Madrid Accords produced the second Arab nation to recognize Israel, Jordan, as well as to mutual recognition between the Palestinian Liberation Organization and Israel. So for the first time, you have the PLO recognizing Israel's legitimacy and right to live in peace and security. That's not a small fiat. 
So hopes were very high at the time, and it's been going downward since then. It started with the assassination of Rabin in 1994, and then Netanyahu led a rejectionist government, coalition into government. That's a coalition that rejected Oslo and the idea of a Palestinian state. And then we had a failed summit in 2000 with Ahud Barak, who defeated Netanyahu in elections in 1999. And the failure of that last attempt in the year 2000, I think we never recovered from that moment. And since then, we've been going to the right. The right has been ruling Israel practically since then. And we have seen the rise of Hamas and other kind of extremist organizations that use terrorism on the Palestinian side. And the gap between the two continued to widen, and that led to where we are today. Where we are today is these three Arab countries have decided to normalize relations with their neighbor. President Trump deserves credit for helping to broker these deals, as well as any ensuing countries that follow suit. However, there is a sense of caution in the foreign relations field. The recent treaties for normalization between Bahrain, the UAE, Sudan, and Israel are, I think, different in kind from previous peace agreements. And outside spectators are often happy to see signs of peace between Arabs and Israelis, no matter where or how, even as some columnists described it, even if it's for the wrong reasons, it doesn't matter. And of course, it is heartwarming to see, you know, flights from Abu Dhabi to Ben Gurion Airport and to see emerging partnerships in business and signs of warmth and decency. Because most of the day, the news you get from the Middle East are not about humanity and decency and warmth and so on. So, of course, it sounds and it looks like a welcome development. Obviously, I hope I'm wrong in this. Unfortunately, those risk to be very short-lived kind of signs of warmth and peace, because it's much more likely that those agreements would turn out to be instead of peace agreements than an actual peace agreement. This problem is made worse by the asymmetry of power between Israel and Palestine. Having the backing of other Arab countries balance this to an extent, and by having individual nations step away from the idea of land for peace, erodes that balance. Of course, both sides feel under threat, so as Israel's security situation improves, the Palestinian situation gets worse. This could lead to further radicalization and less security for Israeli citizens in the long term. In addition, if you're an average Israeli, why would you withdraw from the West Bank? What is the incentive? What's in it for you? And in fact, you can think of it this way. Prime Minister Netanyahu could go out and say, I was right all along. I told you, we don't have to withdraw from the West Bank to get peace. We can have both. We can keep the territory and have peace with the Arabs. And I've shown it. So those agreements make the two-state solution even less likely than they have been. And that's a big problem. But add to it, why those countries? Think about it. Why the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain and Saudi Arabia? This is the axe that is confronting Iran. And they have been cooperating with Israel quietly for some time against Iran. So making this alliance formal emboldens the partners of this alliance even further, which carries the risk of a higher level of confrontation with Iran from their side, which also carries the risk of getting Iran even more nervous than it is and feeling more besieged and targeted than it is historically. That doesn't bode well for regional security. Regardless of how you look at it, the so-called dividends of peace are minimal. It's just you get those nice gestures, some security cooperation, but then after that, I don't see the upside. Thank you to Dr. Fisher for joining me to discuss this very intricate and complex situation. We really appreciate your insights and time. Thank you very much, and thank you for all the good work you're doing. I'm very happy that you're doing this podcast. Taiwan 
and a five New England state, namely Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. That is Director General Jonathan Sun of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in Boston, Massachusetts. He arrived in Boston at the end of July to take over the lead position in what amounts to a diplomatic office for Taiwan. As the U.S. has a special relationship with Taiwan, this is similar to a consulate without the official recognition as such. I spoke with Director General Sun about what his goals are during his placement in this role. I intend to build on this solid foundation in hopes that more people in this area will know about Taiwan, a free and a democratic country and a close ally of the United States. We are also very willing to work with brands and partners to find ways to further enhance our already strong relations with New England in all areas. I've been on this job for more than two months and have gladly discovered that Taiwan has so many good friends and enjoy strong support here which I must be uh, attributed to the hard work of my predecessors and the very able colleagues. This is not his first time in the region, as he has spent extensive time on the east coast of the United States over the years. I'm no stranger to the eastern part of the United States, as I have been living in Providence, Rhode Island for four years while I was studying at Brown University. After joining Taiwan's foreign ministry, I was posted to Washington, D.C. and in New York for six years, respectively. So I really appreciate the opportunity to come to Boston, and I consider this assignment a pleasant surprise. As many of you may know, the history of the U.S.-Taiwan relationship has been a long friendship, although a complex one. As China continues to rise in power, things will only continue to become more difficult. But even though Taiwan and the U.S. do not have formal diplomatic relations, the exchanges between our two countries are very active and comprehensive. The cornerstone of Taiwan-U.S. relations is grounded in the Taiwan Relations Act and the President Reagan's assurances. The former was passed by the U.S. Congress and signed into law by President Carter in 1979. The latter was delivered to our government in July 1982 by then Director of the American Institute in Taiwan Taipei Office, Ambassador James Levy. In my view, the main reason why our two countries can maintain such robust substantive relations is because we share the same values such as democracy, freedom, respect for human rights, rule of law, a market-based economy. This relationship is based upon the principles of mutual respect and mutual trust. It is also mutually beneficial. While the U.S. has been able to provide quite a few benefits to Taiwan, this is not a one-way relationship. For example, in this year's COVID-19 pandemic, Taiwan donated over 12 million surgical masks to the U.S., which fully demonstrates that Taiwan can help and that Taiwan is actually helping. We believe that there is plenty of room for this relationship to grow, and we look forward to working closely with our friends in the U.S. to explore new opportunities. In addition, bilateral trade benefits both sides of this relationship. Taiwan is New Hampshire's 24th largest trading partner, with over $51 million in exports from New Hampshire going to Taiwan. This is down from a high of $70 million in 2017, indicating room for further relationships and growth. Taiwan is a major economic and trade partner of the U.S. To further enhance our bilateral trade, the government of Taiwan announced on August 28, 2020, the decision to lift restrictions on the importation of U.S. beef, resolving a long-standing trade issue between our two countries. We firmly believe that the logical next step is for Taiwan and the U.S. to sign a bilateral trade agreement, as it would be the burden of enterprises conducting cross-border business and the facilitate legal protection of areas like digital trade, intellectual protection, and technical barrier trade. U.S. companies will have more options as they seek to reorganize and reconfigure their supply chains in the future. A Taiwan-U.S. BTA will also help strengthen long-term partnerships between Taiwan's leading semiconductor company and their U.S. counterparts to build a secure ICT supply chain and effectively counter China threats. Our appeal for a Taiwan-U.S. BTA has won strong support in the U.S. Congress. On October 3rd, senators from both parties co-signed 
a letter to the U.S. representative, Ambassador Robert Lighthizer, expressing support for the Taiwan U.S. PDA. We hope negotiations can start soon, so that both sides can discuss all issues of mutual concern and interest. Diving a little deeper into the U.S.-Taiwan trade relation, there is a wide range of products that move between the partners. For an island of 23.8 million people, Taiwan plays a large role in the overall export market for the U.S., and vice versa. Taiwan-U.S. trade relations cover many areas, from agricultural to ICT products. In 2019, bilateral trade in goods between the U.S. and Taiwan reached $87 billion U.S. dollars. Taiwan was the U.S. 10th largest trading partner, 14th largest export market, and the 13th largest source of imports. Taiwan was also the 7th largest export destination of U.S. agricultural goods in the same year. As of December 2019, Taiwan affiliated firms have invested $47 billion U.S. dollars in the U.S. The U.S. is the largest foreign destination of Taiwan's investments. While U.S. investment in Taiwan has reached 24.6 billion U.S. dollars, the U.S. was the second largest source of foreign investment in Taiwan, our second largest trading partner, second largest export market, and the third largest source of imports. In the first half of 2020, Taiwan surpassed France and India in total trade volume with the U.S. and became the U.S. ninth largest trading partner. Taiwan has also become the 11th largest export market of the U.S. The most prominent Taiwanese companies which have been invested in the U.S. include Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, TSMC, and Foxconn. As for U.S. companies, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Wave Services, and Corning have all established operations in Taiwan. In 2019, in fact, the total of New England exports to Taiwan was about $11 billion U.S. dollars. Two-way trade volume is 20 billion U.S. dollars. Major exports to Taiwan from New England include gold, jewelry, medical equipment, ICT products, lobster, liquefied natural gas, that's the name of the Adams, which New Hampshire exported to Taiwan in 2019, include meat, vegetables, linen products, mineral oil, pharmaceutical products, photographic chemical products, cork, etc. Of course, no discussion of U.S.-Taiwan relations can go without a discussion on the role of China in all of this. As tensions have been rising between the U.S. and China, so have tensions between Taiwan and China. In October, Chinese planes crossed the midline of the Taiwan Strait 25 out of 31 days, the highest number seen this year. This continues a year-long increase of antagonistic moves by the People's Liberation Army. Taiwan has been at the forefront of China threats. Since 1949, China has become even more unreasonable, irrational, and provocative this year. As of today, our fighter jets have scrambled over 2,900 times. Intercept Chinese military aircraft that have entered the Taiwan air defense identification zone or cut over the median line on the Taiwan Strait, costing Taiwan nearly 880 million U.S. dollars. Even so, Taiwan will not act rationally and will uphold our principles of peace, parity, democracy, and the dialogue in handling cross-strait relations. President Tsai Ing-wen, in the National Day Address on October 10, reiterated that maintaining peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait is in the best interest of Taiwan and China. Taiwan is committed to upholding cross-strait stability, but it is the joint responsibility of both sides. At this stage, the most Pressing cross street issue is to discuss how we can live in peace and coexist based on mutual respect, goodwill, and understanding. As long as the Beijing authorities are willing to resolve its antagonistic behavior and actions and improve cross street relations, the parity and the dignity are maintained. Taiwan is very willing to work together with China to facilitate a meaningful dialogue. This is what the people of Taiwan advocate. And it also reflects a cross-party consensus in Taiwan. As mentioned before, the U.S.-Taiwan relationship is quite complex. This is shown most aptly by the U.S.'s refusal to explicitly state whether it would come to Taiwan's aid in case of an attack. 
This is designed to deter both sides from taking further aggressive actions and to maintain peace in the region. However, U.S. support for Taiwan's military has been on the rise in recent years, with several different defense contracts completed or underway. Facing growing threats from China, unwavering support from the U.S. is vital to safeguard Taiwan's continued existence and the democratic way of life. Over the years, Taiwan has enjoyed strong bipartisan support in the U.S. Congress. Successive U.S. administrations have also faithfully adhered to the Taiwan Relations Act and the six assurances. For example, since 2017, the U.S. government announced seven arms sales packages to Taiwan, worth over 13 billion U.S. dollars. On March 26, 2020, President Trump signed into law the Taiwan Allies International Protection and Enhancement Initiative Act, aka Taipei Act passed by the U.S. Congress. In August this year, the U.S. Secretary of of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar, visited Taiwan, making him the highest-ranking U.S. cabinet official to visit Taiwan since 1979. All these gestures will not only deter China from being reckless, but also reassure the countries in the Indo-Pacific region that the U.S. remains committed to peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait and in the region. We deeply appreciate the long-standing support and the friendship of the U.S. people and the government. We firmly believe that the stronger our relations are, the safer Taiwan and the world will be. The peace and security of the region is vitally important to the U.S., Taiwan, and China, as war would only lead to death, destruction, and potentially nuclear war. Hopefully, the continued relationship between the U.S. and Taiwan can help to ensure this peace for a long time to come. Thank you to Director General Sun for joining me for this conversation. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. It has been a wonderful experience providing these great interviews for you, and I hope that you've learned something or had your interest further piqued. If you could please rate our podcast and provide any comments, it would be much appreciated. Let us know what topics you would like to learn more about, and we will do our best to hit as many of those as we can. It is our pleasure to have so many people from around the world engaging with our content. This is the Global in the Granite State podcast, a program of the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire. Tim Horgan is our host, editor, producer, and interviewer. Our theme music is Admin by A.A. Alto. Our interlude music is Love Not War by Squire Tuck and Further Discovery by Blear Moon. Hope you will join us again for our next episode later this month. (music) 